Hello and welcome to another episode of The Thriving Metabolism, where we discuss everything that impacts your hormones and metabolism so that you can take control, repair the damage and lose weight consistently without making yourself miserable in the process. Most weight loss strategies and diets actually do harm to your metabolism, resulting in further weight gain down the road. And it can be particularly challenging for women over 40 due to hormonal and metabolic changes. So it's my mission to empower you so that you and your metabolism thrives and you never have to go through diet misery again. I'm Louise Digby, registered nutritional therapist, weight loss expert, and founder of the Nourish Method to Lasting Fat Loss. Okay, so this week it's all about the thyroid. And if you're tuning in and thinking, oh, well, my thyroid's all good, you may well be questioning that by the end of this episode, because as you'll learn, it's a very nuanced and complicated topic with lots of gray area. So whether you suspect a thyroid problem, have been diagnosed with a thyroid problem, or have had your thyroid checked and been told that it's normal, or even if you've never even heard of a thyroid before, then this is one to listen to. So why don't we start with why you might suspect a thyroid problem or what are some of the signs? Well, unsurprisingly, given the focus of this podcast, stubborn weight, weight gain, weight loss resistance, these are all common with underactive or hypothyroidism. And we're going to be talking predominantly about underactive thyroid when it comes to the symptoms, because that's more common and more typical when we're talking about weight. The thyroid hormones are responsible for controlling the speed of the chemical reactions in your body, including the speed at which you burn fat or calories. So essentially, the thyroid is key to the speed of your metabolism. Now, there's a lot more to metabolism than that, but I think it's helpful to know that everything slows down when the thyroid slows down. And because of that, as well as weight issues, you might also experience symptoms of slowness, such as constipation, dry skin, thinning hair, brittle nails, uh, low energy, poor exercise recovery, dark circles under the eyes, disruption to your menstrual cycle, PMS, loss of the outer edge of your eyebrows. Those are some of the key symptoms, but there are more. You may instead experience no symptoms at all or just one or two symptoms. You know, it really varies. Now, one of the confusing things about the thyroid is that you can have all of these symptoms, but a normal reading on your blood test. And there's a few reasons why that can happen. Let's say that you go to your GP because you're struggling with stubborn weight or low energy. And if you don't get told to just eat less and work out more, or you don't just get fobbed off with an antidepressant and they actually run a blood test, they would hopefully include your thyroid in those tests. Many times when this happens, you're told that everything's fine and that they don't need to see you again. But everything isn't fine because that's why you went to the doctors in the first place. So what's going on here? Well, there's a couple of reasons why this might happen. Firstly, the tests done at the doctors are very basic. They often only look at one hormone called TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone. And this technically isn't even really a thyroid hormone. It's produced by your pituitary gland, which is in your brain. And that hormone stimulates your thyroid. So conventional medicine assumes that normal TSH levels equals normal thyroid function, but this is far from the truth. TSH certainly becomes imbalanced at times, but it's usually when there's a more significant thyroid issue. It really doesn't detect the more subclinical or borderline imbalances. And the borderline imbalances are still important to address. They're still gonna have a significant impact on your quality of life and your weight loss progress. Now, sometimes if you're lucky, they may also test another hormone called T4. And this is helpful to have, but it still doesn't give us the full picture. We really wanna be looking at at least the T3 level as well. This is another thyroid hormone and you could have perfect TSH and T4 
and still have low T3. And T3 is actually the most active and potent thyroid hormone. So it's a problem if your T3 is low, even if the other markers are normal. And unfortunately, your doctor just won't test for it. And there's various other bits that we want to be testing too. So that's the first problem. We're not getting the full picture. And the other big problem is that we the reference ranges used are controversial. So when I say reference range, what I mean is the ranges used to determine whether your levels are high or normal or low. So let's use TSH as an example. The normal range of TSH is considered by some labs to be between zero and four. Other labs, I've seen it listed as zero to 10, and I've seen lots of other variations as well. So the fact that it varies so drastically between labs goes to show that there's no real consensus on what normal really is. And partly because the way that laboratories set their normal ranges is by taking a set amount of blood samples, let's say 100. And if they're set in a range for something like TSH, they'll look at blood samples sent in for other reasons and measure the TSH to get the average. So they're taking their average, not from a healthy, symptom-free population, but from a load of people who were having their bloods done anyway, most likely because they have some other health problem. Can you see the problem with doing that? You know, we know that the thyroid becomes more underactive or suboptimal when there are other health issues going on. So they're getting their ranges from an unhealthy population, not a normal one. And what experts think, based on the more current research, is that TSH should be under two. So we've got some labs telling us that it's normal when it's under 10, but really it might need to be under two. And it's the same for all the other thyroid markers as well. So you really have to be looking at your own results or get some expert interpretation. And that's why when people ask me where they can get their thyroid checked, I'm hesitant to say, I'll oh, just go to Medichex or Threva, because while they test more markers than your GP, it really comes down to the interpretation and then translating that information into what needs to change in the diet, your lifestyle, your supplements. And that's really the next thing that I wanted to highlight. Your doctor will tell you that your diet and lifestyle has nothing to do with thyroid function. And that's just so wrong. I don't mean to be doctor bashing here because they do amazing work, especially with how limited and strained the NHS is right now. But we can't escape the fact that doctors get one to two days of nutrition training in their entire seven years of study. They do not get taught how diet and lifestyle impacts things like thyroid function. And when you look at the causes of thyroid problems, they're all diet and lifestyle related. In many cases, you can reverse thyroid problems. I've had plenty of clients come off medication with their doctor's approval, but also with their doctor's surprise because the doctor thinks it's just happened miraculously and not because of the changes they've made to their nutrition. And if the damage can't be reversed, and sometimes it can't, at the very least, you can prevent further thyroid damage, meaning that you won't have to keep increasing your medication as time goes on. And you can also improve the efficiency of your medication as well. So we can stop the damage from happening to prevent the problem from getting worse. So hopefully, even if you haven't grasped the technical side of things, you understand that just because your doctor or your home blood test has told you that everything's normal, it doesn't mean that that's true. After all, we want to be optimal, not just normal. There's going to be a part two on the thyroid where we go into the causes of thyroid problems and what we can do about them. So I hope you'll join me for that. Okay, so now it's the part of the show where I share my favorite facts from the past week. Quite a few listeners have reached out to say that they're really enjoying my fact of the week, which is so great to hear. I really love digging through the research and finding these pearls of wisdom. So I'm really glad you're enjoying it too. And it's really lovely to hear from people who are listening as well. So this week, the fact is this, 
gut microbes can boost motivation to exercise. What can these gut microbes not do? Seriously, the more I research the gut, the more you see that basically everything, every problem, every symptom, every craving or anything is linked to what's going on in the gut. Now, one caveat here is that this study was on mice. So it's not information that we can directly transfer onto humans. However, mice are studied a lot because they are a really good model of what happens in the human body, believe it or not. What the research shows is that there are certain species of bacteria that produce metabolites or molecules that make us produce more dopamine when we exercise. And dopamine is like the reward. It's the reward brain chemical. When we're addicted to things, it's because we're addicted to the dopamine hit that it gives us. So those people who get a real buzz from working out and find it easy to get off the couch and move their bodies and are maybe even a little bit addicted to working out, they probably have more of these bacteria in their guts. It's very early days on this research, so there's not a specific probiotic that you can take to give you this bacteria. But what we know is that there's heaps of stuff that we can do to take care of our guts. And doing so helps the good bacteria thrive and hopefully in turn will help us to want to be more active. So some simple things that you can do include eating a wide variety of unprocessed plant-based foods, avoiding artificial sweeteners, keeping sugar and refined carbs to a minimum, eating foods like um, sauerkraut and kimchi and taking a course of probiotics after taking antibiotics to protect our friends in our guts. So those are some simple but solid foundations for getting you started with a healthier gut. Okay, now we are opening up one of my listeners' letters. So let's dive right in. Let me just load it up in front of me. Okay, she said, Hi, Louise, loving the podcast. Please could you answer my question on your podcast? I'm 43, mum of two, work full time, I'm currently three stone overweight. I've never been skinny, but I have mainly gained weight in the last three to four years, accelerated by lockdown. In the new year, this year, I managed to get my arse in gear and do something about it. I mean, I didn't eat badly in the first place, but I wasn't being very mindful. So I tried to be sensible, no crazy diet, just making sure I ate lots of veg, minimal refined carbs, lots of protein, lots of walking, swimming, and a bit of strength training. I've been really good, but after two months, I've only lost five pounds, and two of those were in the first week. I'm absolutely gutted. What am I doing wrong? Okay, I really appreciate you bringing this question to the podcast because I think the answer is going to help many women. We see this with our clients all the time, okay? Firstly, I'm proud of you for taking the sensible approach and sticking with it this long. Obviously, I'm working with limited information here, but on the face of it, it sounds like you've made great choices food and exercise wise. Here's the thing. We see TV programs and videos or posts online that normalize losing loads of weight quickly. But let's look at what you've lost. Five pounds is the equivalent of two and a half bags of flour. That's a lot. You just don't see the significance because it seems like everyone else is losing way more. And because the weight comes off from all over your body, you don't really notice feeling any lighter. So it's important to put into context what you have lost. It's also important to factor in that you can do strength training, which is great. And I don't know about you, but if I'm spending time lifting weights or doing push-ups, I want to see some muscle gains from that. You need to remember that you may well have gained muscle. So you may have lost more fat than you realize. We really need to lose this obsession with the scales. It's such a terrible way to measure progress. And it doesn't tell you what you've lost or gained. Is it fat? Is it muscle? Is it water? Are you just constipated? There's so many of the women that joined the Nourish Method, my weight loss program, they do all their measurements at the beginning, like their hips and their waist, et cetera. And then they don't bother again after that. And they just focus on their weight. And then when they come complaining about how they've not lost much weight, we ask them to do their measurements. And then often they're shocked at how many inches they've lost. And that's what we all want, right? 
who cares what the scales say? You know, what most women who are trying to lose weight really want is to fit into their clothes better. So why not use your clothes as progress or your measurements as progress? The next thing to say is that you told me that you've been carrying extra weight for around three years. That weight gain may have partly been the result of lockdown and inactivity, but we don't just gain weight because of overeating and under-exercising. There may have been many years of metabolic damage building up because of nutrient deficiencies or stress or poor sleep or high toxic load or any number of things. The weight gain is a symptom of that. We don't just repair that damage as soon as we start eating more mindfully. I mean, it definitely helps, but that repair takes time. And that's why I'm always talking about consistency. We have to be consistent, even when the progress is slow and it feels like it's not working, to give our bodies time to heal and repair. Lastly, while it sounds like you've got a good foundation in place, there may be deeper imbalances that need to be addressed, like your hormones or gut issues. And these imbalances aren't always obvious. But if you bear in mind that weight gain is a symptom of imbalance, then focusing on some of the other signs your body is giving you may help you get to the root of the stubborn weight. For example, if you have any digestive symptoms or food intolerances, it's definitely worth focusing on your gut health rather than your weight. And you'll probably find that weight loss comes as a side effect of healing your gut. Another example, if you have inflammatory symptoms like eczema, acne, joint pain, you know, focusing on anti-inflammatory foods and avoiding foods that you might suspect you're sensitive to, you know, again, making sure the gut's happy helps with inflammation. See, I told you that the gut was linked to everything. So I hope that helps you feel a little bit better about things. Keep going. You're doing really great and you will get there. And sometimes we just have to give it time. We have to give our bodies time to mend. If we've had these problems building up over years, if we have been carrying the weight for years, our body isn't just going to magically start burning fat efficiently and get rid of all of that metabolic damage overnight. We need to give our bodies time to mend and repair. And on that note, if you haven't heard, my Mend Your Metabolism five-day challenge is back. Starting on the 13th of March and running for five days, this challenge is going to help you get the foundations in place to begin mending your metabolism. Years of suboptimal nutrition, disrupted sleep, a hectic life, it can leave you with metabolic damage, making weight loss a real challenge, even when you're eating well and keeping active. And as you've learned from previous episodes, cutting calories or the typical diets can further the damage and we need to go deeper and repair the damage so that you can start seeing results. So this is for you if you're struggling to make progress, whether that's because nothing works for you or because you just don't know what to do. Whether you know you have a sluggish metabolism or you just suspect, this is gonna give you the foundations and the momentum that you need. Find out more by visiting louisedigbynutrition.click forward slash metabolism or use the link in my Instagram bio. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you'd like to talk to me about anything that I've discussed in this episode, you can reach me on Facebook and Instagram by searching at Louise Digby Nutrition. You can email me with your question to be answered on the podcast by emailing louise at louisedigbynutrition.com and putting podcast into the subject. If you're enjoying this podcast, please head to Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, click follow and leave a review. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.